Welcome to the program. This is What's Your Story. My name is Catherine Mwangi. So the last month we have been celebrating women from different fields who've overcome uh, tragedy and travesty and they have triumphed in their own different ways and so for April we decided hey look let's find some incredible captains of industry that can share their stories <coughs> their journeys on how they got to where they are now and to kickstart the month for us we have the group CEO and MD of Sassini PLC Martin Ochia thank you Thank you for making it. Oh, you're welcome. And, and thanks thank for you having for making me. me feel overdressed. <laughs> this was not you part of smart. the deal. You look smart. You look really, really good. <laughs> I have to say it so that people don't imagine I was trying to, <coughs> to do the CEO. Okay. It's, not a, it's, it's a career limiting <laughs> move, you know. <laughs> but you're well, though? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Yeah? There are very few people who advance their careers by dressing up. So, don't, yeah, don't, don't stress. <laughs> I shouldn't stress. No. That tells me already your very different um, mindset very different mindset yeah uh, one has to be careful that you don't stereotype yourself into a box yeah. with these jobs or with these roles uh, and not just the roles I think leadership generally uh, it's important to have the general aspects of what leadership mm. entails mm -hmm. but it's also really critical that you think about your own individual brand yes. and the way you like to do things mm. yeah I, I, I'm glad you picked that up because I deliberately try to be different Mm. Yeah, in a lot of things. I like that, including mm. for a gentleman wearing neon colors. <laughs> that's like a tick a hundred times. Why do men shy away from these colors? <coughs> I think the whole issue of um, being traditional and safe, the colors that are safe. So um, in suits, for example, if you're being formal, black, gray, blue, that's fine. Yes, people will frown at you if you wear a purple suit to the <laughs> office. Well, in actual sense, purple suits can be really classy. Yeah. So uh, I'm also very traditional in formal wear. Uh, I tend to stay with those safe colors. Okay. But when I'm in formal, I'm a bit more open to color. Okay. And I think the, the African texture in fabric is so rich that it's a bit of a shame if we can't express ourselves through these colors. So yeah, I'm glad you noticed that. And it's something that uh, uh, sometimes you get people looking at you like, well, that's not a male color, but you know, yeah, it yeah, looks plan. good on you. <laughs> Thank I you. wish more men would go this direction mm. Thank and you. not stick to safe when it comes to casual wear. Mm. But uh, Martin, your journey as, as a <coughs> business titan, it's not just here in Kenya, but Africa, uh, um, you have an international landscape where your career is concerned. But I want us to start with Sassini and work backwards. Mm -hmm. So you got your appointment a year before a global pandemic. Yeah. So you're checking in as the group CEO, MD, and you're happy you have your strategies in place, you know what you need to do to, you know, get to the next level. Yeah. And then COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was actually a very difficult time for Sassini. Uh, so I got in in March of 2019. We at the time were going through, we're in the middle of a financial year that wasn't going well. Okay. Uh, global prices for commodities that we deal in were had plummeted to rock bottom levels that hadn't been seen for a long time. Uh, it was clear to me when I got in, we had six months to the end of the financial year. It was clear to me then that uh, we we're going to end up in a loss making scenario, and we did. That year, uh, we lost uh, after tax 340 million shillings, which is a huge amount to lose for a business our size. Uh, and so that was the one issue. The other issue is you say I came in with strategies. I really didn't. Oh. Uh, no, I came in uh, because I don't think you can go into a new company and a new industry with your own strategies. You've got to go, well, maybe people do, but I prefer to go and learn before you decide where, where you want to take the organization strategically. That takes you anything between six weeks and six months, depending on how quickly you, you want to learn or how complex that business is. Yeah. And so by about uh, end of April, for me, uh, I ticked that box, knew exactly what we needed to do. Uh, there were issues that we were struggling with. A lot of them were operational, but uh, they were operational because the strategic direction wasn't very strong. And so we ended up getting into a situation where we needed to set a new strategic platform mm -hmm. to give us a new path to follow. Uh, so we spent um, <coughs> the better part of my first three months doing that and uh, got a, the board to approve that new strategic platform, a new direction <coughs> around August of 2019. 
uh, in readiness for the start of our new financial year in October of that year. Right. And so by the time we were budgeting for the new financial year, it was based on the, on the new strategy or the new strategic framework. Right. So that worked well. And then we started October 2019, um, that financial year. And we had a good, strong first quarter and a fairly good second quarter, which starts in January, February. And then in March, uh, just as uh, we had announced our results of the previous year, uh, the pandemic hit. In fact, we got the first case of COVID-19 in the country on the day we held our AGM, on March 6, uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was uh, clear to me that this was going to affect our business and we needed to uh, be very fast with how we were going to respond and what it meant. Eh? Luckily for me, I had experiences in the past working for multinational organizations facing pandemics like this with H1N1 um, in late 2009 and then with SARS in the early part of the millennium. And so that really coined my thinking around what we needed to do. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really clear to us how big this was going to be but we knew that it was going to disrupt us being a global business. So yeah, that, those were interesting times, interesting yeah. times. And then the rest of that year, just it was what it was. We ended up being positive in our profit, uh, but it was a challenging year. Yeah. yeah. I like what you said there, and, and thank you for that correction. Maybe it's because of what I've been exposed to in the past, where um, a new CEO takes over and they come in <coughs> with their plans without necessarily um, giving credence or at least observing what has been done before what we need to fix, just learning the environment you've gone into. And, and so someone comes with this plan and you must do it this way. So in what you have said, there's a lesson. Yeah, you, you, Sassini is 70 years old. They couldn't be here if they haven't done things well and successfully. So, I mean, there, there's no magic bullet there that somebody would come in with and then just change things and all of a sudden it's super successful. Um, uh, and it's, any business that's been running for a long time and has been successful does things in a certain way. And, and so your influence on that business as a leader comes only after you've learned that way. And then you see what works and what doesn't. And then you change the things that don't work. Yeah, yeah if you go in with your own, I mean, what would you know to come in with? Because you've not worked in there. Uh, <clears throat> there's nothing you really, you don't know the people. Yeah. Uh, you, you may be exposed through the onboarding process uh, to what their strategies are, what their successes are, and of course you know something. Uh, you'll have studied them before you join them, uh, and, and you have those top-line views. But the intricacies of running the business, uh, that you have to get into, fold your sleeves, get to the shop floor, get to learn that, before you can start giving strategic direction on what to change. Mm. And that's no different for Sassini, or no yeah. different for me. Mm. I like that. that. There's so much wisdom in that. We've been talking about Sassini and uh, most people know that for tea and coffee, but I know you do or are involved with other products. Could you speak to that? Yes, yeah, so traditionally Sassini started as a coffee business mm -hmm. in 1952, precisely on the 15th of February 1952. A few months ago we were celebrating uh, our 70th anniversary. And then uh, what happened in the central Kenya region in Kiambu where we started at the time the founder then was really keen on expanding uh, and he, his vision was to be the country's biggest agricultural business, which today we are. And uh, very quickly moved from uh, being a coffee enterprise by buying other coffee estates around the Kiambu area uh, uh, to then delve into tea in the right. west of the Rift Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, and the tea business, uh, which we call Kipkebe Limited, uh, then joined the business in the late 50s and ran as a coffee and tea business all the way to about four or five years ago. Um, and in fact, at some stage, was called Sassini Tea and Coffee uh -huh. because of those two commodities. Then uh, four years, five years back, uh, we decided to diversify our revenue and profit streams based on what we were seeing as opportunities in the global market uh, around the fruits and nuts uh, segments. Mm. So we launched our avocado business because avocado consumption was on a steep still is on a very okay. steep uh, growth curve. The global demand outstrips the global supply something like 10 to 1. And so we said, okay, let's get into this and, um, and try see if we can be a leader in that business from okay. Kenya. And then the nuts business is very lucrative. Uh, it's a very diverse and, and broad business. 
So it depends on what nuts you want to get into. We chose macadamia because of one, the demand that we were seeing, the availability of the market, but it's also the world's most expensive nut. And so uh, the opportunities for us to then use the asset of land that we have to create new orchards for the avocado and the nut trees is it, just a no-brainer really. Um, and so we launched those just as I was coming into the business. The avocado business was launched that year and the nuts business was launched the, the year after. They have started very well, uh, very strongly, to the point where in our last financial year, which we closed in September last year, those two businesses contributed almost 40% of our profit. So to get 40% of your net profit from businesses you've launched in the last three years is really commendable. It's phenomenal. Yeah, so we hope to continue looking for opportunities for growth like that yeah. in the strategic framework of the agricultural realm of the work that we do. And when we see those opportunities, we'll take them. Do you distribute those particular products here, especially the nuts? No, we don't. Oh. So, so our business is, by all intents and purposes, an export business. Mm. Um, uh, so we are involved in the growing, uh, producing, manufacturing, packing, marketing, and exporting of tea, coffee, avocado, and macadamia. Uh, and we had a small retail, sorry, uh, dairy business uh, mm -hmm. that is for local production. Okay. And then we have what you're referring to, which is uh, an FMCG business, very, really, really small uh, for tea and coffee. So because we export top range quality for tea and coffee, we decided to pack it for local consumption as well. Mm. It's really small though. Uh, and so basically we're an export business. So we don't, we don't distribute avocado and macadamia locally at all. Okay. Mm. Why do you refer to your tea and coffee as small? That's what we know. <laughs> uh, small by, uh, virtue of volume uh, in comparison with uh, we, you know, what other brands exist in the market. So our tea brand, Sassini Tea, is the third biggest tea brand in the market okay. after, after our two top competitors. Mm -hmm. Our coffee business is also number three in market share in terms of volume. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there is opportunity and in fact we do have a strategic need to drive more consumption of tea and coffee f okay. uh, in Kenya. Because really, we don't consume those beverages. We really think we do, but, but not much. Just give you a quick example. Mm -hmm. Kenya produces between 500 and 600 million kilos of black tea a year. 4% um, of that is consumed locally. 4%. And so, yes, we all grew up with tea, and we say we're a tea-drinking we country. We consume 20 million kilos. And so, it's really... It's really small, uh, and, and I think for a country that produces that level of quality and that level of quantity for the global market, we are the biggest exporter of black tea in the world. We consume very little of it. So there's uh, a need for companies like Sassini to play a bigger part in driving that consumption. We are really not a big tea consuming business. No. It's even smaller in coffee. Here? Yeah. I would never have thought. Yeah, most people don't because uh, it's a cup of tea a day in the morning for breakfast. If you compare us with Pakistan, for example, an average Pakistani resident drinks between 7 and 12 cups a day. Uh, average. So you can imagine there are people who are going into their 20s in terms of cups of consumption. So we, we, we are a small consumer of tea. But we, we make the world's best quality and produce the world's uh, highest quantity of black tea. Yeah. Export, yeah, I'm fascinated mm. by tea, man. Like I'm the tea parties. You drink tea? Uh, oh, oh, yeah. That's what I shop for. If I travel, yeah. I'm, I'm getting different types of teas, and I like to learn where these come from. Okay. Uh, how do you how do you drink it? I love the Ceylon. Yeah. So my favorite right now. So it goes with season. So now I'm on the Five Roses from South Africa. Yeah. I I, I love it. Yeah. I don't know why we don't have this here. Yeah. Martin Sassini do something. <laughs> I don't so, have so, so that's, a, that's an interesting thing you say. You, if you drink tea in the world, yeah. anywhere in the world, chances that the, it's Kenyan tea are about 90%. Mm. Uh, remember I said we are the biggest exporter of black tea in the world. So who do we export to? Big buyers globally who then blend Kenyan teas and pack them for redistribution into their brands. So if you're drinking a Lipton in South Africa, there's Kenyan tea in it. Really? If you're drinking five roses from South Africa, it's probably Sassini tea because of the nature of that industry uh, and the fact that we are the biggest producer. Uh, I would be very surprised if you can find a tea blend in a tea pack that does not have Kenyan tea. That's just 
just fascinating. Yeah, unless you go to India, <coughs> because India is the second largest producer of tea. They make about 1.5 1 1 million kilos of black tea a year. But almost 100% of that is consumed in India. And so you don't see it in the export market. It used to be there, but not that much anymore. Uh, China is actually the biggest producer of tea, uh, about 2 million kilos oh, wow. uh, of tea, but it's consumed in China. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll see aspects of Chinese green tea in global markets yes. here and there. Uh, but those two countries being the biggest producers consume their teas locally. Kenya is the third largest producer of tea at 500, 600 million kilos. All of it is for export like I've told you, except 4% that it's yeah. consumed here. Yeah. So if you're consuming tea anywhere in the world, you should have more respect then for <laughs> tea. Yeah, and, and tea, a lot of people don't realize, tea, tea contributes 7% of the GDP as an industry and 25% of uh, forex and in the country. One crop. And so uh, it, it, we're really proud to be involved with yeah. it. You know, it's, it's, it's a massive uh, driver of the Kenyan economy. Yes. Yeah. So your passion as, a, as, as you have been, you have led companies in different parts of uh, the world. And um, then you came back home in 2019 now to run this agriculture business. Uh, but speak to the experience, especially um, outside of Africa. How, diff how different is it running a business it's in the Middle East, right? Yeah, uh, the Middle East, Europe, uh, even in the rest of the continent, uh, because running a business in Kenya uh, sometimes very different from running a business in the western side of the continent or in South Africa for, the, for that matter. Uh, and it's also very different from running continental businesses in Europe uh, or in North Africa, uh, sorry, North America. Uh, or in the subcontinent of Asia. So I've, I've been very lucky to work in all these regions. Mm. And uh, there's a common thread of what a corporate is. But uh, the nuances are uh, clouded in the differences that the cultures bring and the geographies and small little things like weather <laughs> uh, and the people, language. Yeah. Uh, but, but mostly culture uh, and religion. Uh, are really influential in, in how one behaves depending on where they are. And so for me, the experiences have been uh, very diverse. What makes you successful is the ability to adapt and totally integrate yourself when you're in a different country. I've seen colleagues of mine who moved from, moved from South Africa, for example, to Australia, but they had one foot in Cape Town and one foot in Sydney it doesn't really work because they don't move with their whole heart mm. and so you, you go to Sydney to work on a two-year assignment but you're thinking gosh man, I, I wish I could be back home in South Africa you know that kind of thing uh, my philosophy has been when I started relocating for jobs is to completely move so you I would go and then I would assimilate myself find a local church to go to uh, find a local community to go to find uh, schools obviously that are suitable for the children um, and integrate yourself in that local community so you move with your heart. Mm. Uh, I've done that several times and so um, when you're doing it it's not easy but when you look back that forms the very strong fabric of what makes you successful. I could pack my bags today and go to Tokyo and I'll fit in uh, despite the fact that uh, that's not my home country it's a very different culture. Yeah, yeah so uh, when it comes when you translate that into running the business um, the, the general thread and the norms being similar, those things are there. But it's it, what makes you successful or not is how you react to these cultures and these differences in geographies, in in weather, yeah. in in windows like yeah. language uh, that are very different from one place to the next. Okay, so we'll get to hear more about your experiences out there. Uh, we need to take a quick short commercial break. Uh, we'll be back in a little bit. The best way to position yourself for growth anywhere is to do what you currently have excellently. And, uh, and so that, you know, because that really is your biggest marketing tool, is what you're currently doing. I, I can't be looking to give you more if the little you've got is not being done excellently. And so that would be my first advice. It's just focus on what you've got now and, and just do it so well that you leave people with no option but to look to expand you.
Welcome back. It's What's Your Story. We're here at the Exchange Bar at the Stanley Hotel having a tea conversation <laughs> with this Sini, Sa, Sini PLC Group CEO and MD, Martin Ochien. So Martin, were you always um, intrigued or passionate about wanting to work outside Kenya? Or did the opportunities just present themselves? No, no, no I was very deliberate about Oh, is it? No, very deliberate. Okay. I, uh, and I was very lucky in a sense. So when I got out of the university in the early 90s, um, uh, I volunteered as a research scientist. I'd studied biological science in the university. I wanted to be an epidemiologist. I ended up being a parastologist. I sometimes wonder why I studied those things. Uh, but I volunteered at the National Museums of Kenya in the Department of uh, Ornithology, which is the uh, study of birds. Uh, and just as I was settling down to, to start that work because I really wanted to go into biological research, uh, in fact I wanted to go into medical research, um, I got a call from a pharmaceutical company that uh, wanted a medical rep. A medical representative is basically um, a salesperson mm -hmm. who talks about prescription medicines to doctors, pharmacists, nurses and hospitals for the cure of specific diseases. Okay. To do that, you've got to have the training to be able to understand medicine and to talk to professionals about, about that so that they can prescribe your product when they encounter those diseases with patients. Uh, so long story short, a uh, couple of weeks at the National Museum, so I joined this pharmaceutical company, uh, 3M Healthcare. And 3M Healthcare is part of the 3M conglomerate, which is probably the world's most diversified business. Mm -hmm. But before I could rise in 3M, I moved to a company called Warner Lambert. Okay. At the time, uh, Warner Lambert was an American business, second largest pharmaceutical business in the world then. And there were specialists in uh, certain therapeutic areas, cardiology, uh, treatment of asthma, neurology as well. And uh, while working there um, as a territory manager in charge of the Western Kenya region, Eastern Uganda and Western Tanzania, a very big region in actual sense. So managing all aspects of our business there with doctors, pharmacists, nurses and hospitals. Um, I did that uh, in the late 90s and then uh, in 1999, Wana Lambert and Pfizer, and Pfizer was then a smaller business than Wana Lambert but was more successful, had cash, had uh, uh, very good prospects for the future but had uh, a not very strong R&D pipeline and so they saw Warner Lambert which had a, a very good mm -hmm. pipeline of launching blockbusters mm -hmm. as, a, as a union that would help them get to the number one position they wanted globally. So those businesses were merged sometime in 1999 and uh, I got the opportunity then to run the Pfizer consumer healthcare business in East Africa. Uh, at the same time <laughs> went to Oxford to study for my MBA and um, you know juggling those two balls uh, being able to run a business successfully and also study sponsored by the same business on condition that you pass and that you succeed here yes um, very strong character building stuff but i went through that and when i was done with that i moved to cape town with pfizer uh, to go and head a uh, marketing function for initially sub-saharan african mm -hmm. markets and then eventually for African Middle East. Um, so, so that started um, my, my sort of like exertion outside of the country. But when I was at 3M Healthcare, it was a multinational. What I liked most about it is the American philosophy to corporate life mm. and what you do. Uh, and I knew that these markets in Africa were small. And so for you to really grow, you had to get out of there. Uh, of these markets into the global markets. Uh, and those organizations, the beauty of multinationals is they, they give you these opportunities if you're good enough mm. to work in other markets okay. and keep growing. So I made it my goal that I'll get out and, and, and pursue that and I'm very glad with where that took me. Hmm. Mm. So it was intentional, it doesn't it, just come. It was very intentional. I, I remember um, when I left 3M and joined Wana Lambert, uh, when I joined the first three weeks they took me to Cape Town for training. Uh, as they all do when you d join at a certain level. And uh, I went to the head office of what was then the African Middle East region in a place called Tokai in the southern suburbs of Cape Town. 
It's a nice building, two-story building, big, big setup with a factory as well. And um, I had joined with maybe three other people in the Kenyan business and then another six people in the rest of the African business. So we were going to train as a group. Mm -hmm. When we got there, uh, obviously we were awed by this massively <laughs> well-organized organization yeah. and business. Uh, and walking through the corridors, I said to one of my <laughs> colleagues, his name is Isaac Nsereko, he was, he was my colleague from, uh, from Uganda. I mm -hmm. said to him, Isaac, one day, I'm not very far from today, I'm gonna work in one of these offices. And he looked at me and he says, you're such a joker. You know, th yeah, there's no way <laughs> who's going to bring you here. You've just joined Wana Lambert. Can you just you know, come uh -huh. down? And I said, no, no, you'll see me here. Three years later, I was there. So it was very deliberate. It was really, really deliberate to, to, to pursue my career out of mm. the country. Yeah. And I'm glad that I did. So speaking to people who are in corporate right now, whichever industry, whatever field, and you know, they may not have those international, multinational opportunities, but they know that I need to rise up the ladder where I am now. What are some of the principles or values that they need to have or put in? What's the work you put in so that you get to rise? A lot of people approach that subject, in my view, the wrong way. Okay. Yeah, they, they, they focus on where they need to go, which is not bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, but often when you do that, you forget to focus on what you need to do now. Uh, the advice I give people, and I was given this advice myself, is the best way to position yourself for growth anywhere is to do what you currently have excellently. And, uh, and so that, you know, because that really is your biggest marketing tool, is what you're currently doing. I, I can't be looking to give you more if the little you've got is not being done excellently. And so that would be my first advice. It's just focus on what you've got now and, and just do it so well that you leave people with no option but to look to expand you and to expand your horizon, to expand your experience and to give you more. If you happen to be in a multinational organization, inevitably that means that you will outgrow the geography you are in and you'll have to be put somewhere else. Mm. I have a friend, I won't mention his name, yeah. when I was considering because I knew for about nine months mm -hmm. that I was going to relocate uh, for my first job out of the country. I had a chat with him. We were watching rugby and uh, I was already running the East African business here. So he asked, I said to him, I'm gonna go to Cape Town. Uh, and he said to me, why the hell would you do that? And I said, well, it's just part of my growth. He said, but here, you're a big fish in a small pond. There, you're just gonna be a small fish in one big ocean. I said, says who? Uh, I might get there and be a big fish in a big ocean, you know. So um, th those scenarios, because there are people who are really skeptical about working outside. I wasn't one of those. Yeah. I really pursued that career. Uh, and I guess for me, coming back now with all this experience, 20 years out of the country, yes. to bring it uh, back and be able to contribute in my small way to Sassini and to any organization I work for or, or the economy, it's mm -hmm. really, really uh, heartwarming. And so I would say to people, do what you have today best. Mm. The opportunities will open up. Mm. Yeah. The universe aligns for us uh, things that are of the same essence. If you're a poor worker, you're going to get poor results and you're going to get poor opportunities. If you put in the work, you're going to get good opportunities and some of those opportunities will be out of the country. The other thing I would say mm -hmm. is, um, and I say this to, uh, you know, our children, yes. the people who are younger than us, mm. is the world's become a small global village. When you go to school today, you're training to compete with a child in Japan and in Canada and in Australia. And so when the opportunities come, they'll be in Japan, in Canada and in Australia. You can't limit your thinking to the Kenyan economy. Right. Uh, mm. And whereas this is not true for every Kenyan because not everybody can pursue external opportunities. It is true for a lot of people. Those opportunities do exist. And the Kenyan population has a very strong work ethic. Yes. Yeah, and so we need to exploit that. And in fact, there are a lot of Kenyans in diaspora who are doing great amounts of work with excellence. Yes. Uh, and so uh, be deliberate if that's what you want. Put all your thought into it. Put all your effort into it. You'll end up in a global site somewhere. Hmm. I, like, I really like that. Like build the now. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Who do you look up to in, in, um, in business? Oh, that's a broad question. I had uh, um, 
a leader once, um, uh, his name was Steve Grabenow. I worked with him in Wana Lambert, and then we went together to Pfizer. And um, he was head of marketing for uh, sub-Saharan business when I was here in Kenya. Uh, he was based in Cape Town. Yeah. And he inspired me uh, to specialize in marketing as a competence area. And so when I went to Oxford, Oxford to do my MBA, my specialization was in marketing and strategy uh, as a result of Steve's influence. Mm. Um, I then qualified into that, and then I went into classical marketing roles, and uh, from brand management to regional brand management to regional category management to marketing directorships uh, for big organizations to being a global marketing director in a business uh, that was global. And so he, he stands out for me. Um, there's another gentleman, uh, Patrick Wright. I worked with him in Wanda Lambert and Pfizer as well. Mm -hmm. He gave me the introduction into being a hard manager. So uh, management and leadership calls for a multiplicity of skill. So I would credit him as well with part of my journey. Mm. Brent Cleave, again from the same two companies, okay. he unfortunately is no longer with us, but um, he gave me the zeal and the fire to drive commercial aspects of business. He was a sales director, became an export director, and became a commercial director within businesses that I worked with. And as I rose to sort of like catch up with him in his career, I learned a lot from him mm. around driving uh, the spearheaded part of commercial in, in a business. Yeah. And so I credit those guys. Today, if I could shift, um, uh, when I joined Sassini, I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Noshad Mirali, mm. the late Dr. Noshad Mirali, uh, who was the group chairman of the Samia Investment Group, of uh, which Sassini is part. Uh, they are part of our major shareholder. Yeah. What would you say is the price you have paid to get to where you are now? Yeah, it's not easy being away from home. Um, uh, I, I am one of four children that my mother and dad had. Uh, we lost dad in 1991, I was still in college. And so, and I'm the only son. So, <laughs> mm. overnight, I, I became dad, and I'm the firstborn as well. Mm. And uh, mom defaulted to me for all the major decisions she wanted to make. Uh, to my surprise, like, why are you asking me? You know, you're there a lot in this relationship. I'm just a student. <laughs> you know, just go ahead and do what you want to do. Firstborn talk like that. You why? know? <laughs> and uh, she just said, no, your dad's not here now, so you you got to participate in these decisions. So take, help me take care of your sisters. Yeah which we did, we all went through college, eventually we all went to work outside. So I left to go to Cape Town, uh, first to the UK and then to Cape mm -hmm. Town, and then uh, my sister Carol went to Europe and Maureen and Linda followed uh, around 2003, between 2003 and 2006, and they've been away since. So oh. mom was here on her own, obviously with help. Mm. Uh, she then retired and went uh, uh, to a retirement place in the rural, in the rural parts of mm -hmm. the country. Uh, being away from her and seeing her miss all of us, I think that was difficult. But it, it was necessary for all our careers that yeah. we do that. Yeah. Uh, and I think my drive to want to work outside drove my sisters to want to do the same. Mm. Sometimes I feel like uh, if I didn't have the same drive, they would have made different choices. But I'm very happy they made those choices because their lives uh, have been very diversified in terms of the experiences they have. Yeah. Yeah, so that would be one, mm. uh, being away from mom for all that time. Mm. Uh, and as a boy and a firstborn, and one whose father died when he was young, my relationship with my mother is very strong. Uh, and so she's one of the reasons I chose to, came back, mm. to come back, because um, uh, I just felt like in her later years, uh, it would be nice to spend that time with her. Yeah, yeah and there are other sacrifices that uh, a, a strong global corporate leadership career uh, makes you go through. Yeah. You know, difficulties in personal relationships, uh, in friendships, because when you're moving all the time, <laughs> you, you don't really settle on friends. Uh, but there's a misnomer I need to address. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think the higher you go, the easier life is from a work perspective. I found the exact opposite. Uh, I have more work now than I had when I was a medical rep. It may be that um, uh, I have more help, obviously, so that makes it maybe easier. But I don't have the philosophy of uh, you work less at the top. Mm. 
Mm. Uh, actually, I don't have enough time to complete the tasks sometimes I do have. Yeah. And one of the things you struggle with here is creating time for yourself to be in your own bubble and your own space, thinking about nothing else but you. And so if you're not deliberate about those things, you end up just being on a treadmill every day. So how then do you unwind? How do you make time for yourself? Oh, that's easy. I do two things, maybe, maybe three things that uh, wind me down. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a hardcore gymnast. So I, I train, uh, and whether it's training in the gym or riding my bicycle, which I do on alternate days, uh, that gets me really wound down. Um, and then um, I play golf, and so mm -hmm. I have this dedicated four hours in a week where I just block out everything and I yeah. play golf. Yeah. I don't have my phone on me. Um, yeah. My office people know that time that I am not available, and it just allows me to be myself out there, yeah. breathing fresh air and hitting that small ball. Mm. So my day starts typically at about four in the morning. Okay. Uh, for several reasons, I like to be awake at that time, mm -hmm. but I also can't sleep at that time. Past that time. <laughs> From when I was in school. So I wake up anyway instead of turning around in bed and doing nothing. <laughs> and then I read for about an hour. And then 5 o'clock I start getting ready, leave and get to the office at 6 o'clock. Uh, why? Because that gives me two and a half hours, two to two and a half hours before everybody else comes in. And that time I do the bulk of my work. Um, the work mm. that needs intellectual input, I do then. The work that needs a lot of... Uh, you know, concentration and thinking. There's no one in the office. There's no phone ringing. There's nobody bothering you. So two, uh, two hours is all I need. So when everybody then comes in and needs your support in their work, you're available for them. But also, more importantly, you've done your bit. Okay. And then that goes on uh, until about uh, four o'clock. I leave the office at four mm -hmm. to get home at about five o'clock. And then if it's a day for going to the gym, I would go to the gym. If it's a day for riding my bike, change, jump onto my bike and do a 20 kilometer ride. Uh, get home half past six, uh, shower quickly, straight into the kitchen. So I'm the one who cooks at home. And that is... Wait, wait, wait. Let's not rush over that point. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of the most relaxing exercises for me. And it's not new. I've done this for a long time. Uh, one, I enjoy it. Two, uh, it's a continuation of my dad's legacy. He rarely cooked. In fact, I think I saw him cook less than five times in the time we spent with him. Okay. But when he did, we ate and wanted more. And so, remember I grew up with girls only, and so my mom, in putting up rosters for us to do work while we were growing up, treated me as one of the girls. <laughs> and so I learned all these things that my sisters were doing. I hated some of them, and I liked some of them. And one of the ones that I liked was cooking. So I just took up that, and uh, I've cooked all my life. So when I get home now, every day, so I'll get into the kitchen. Sometimes I plan it over the weekends because I've got time to go to the grocery store, buy what I want to cook. But during the weekdays, walk in, open the fridge, and stare at what's there and decide what to cook right on the spot. The most relaxing exercise I do in a day. And then um, you and have dinner. This is how my joy is on the, I know you're just going on and like yeah, it's a normal it's, thing. It is normal. <laughs> Cooking is part of my routine. Um, when I was younger, in my 20s, I also went to pubs after work, but you outgrow that. And in fact, I credit my living in Cape Town to leaving that part of my life behind because uh, when you live out of the country, in a foreign country, um, your family becomes your connection. And so w w when you're at work, you work, and then when you leave work, you go home. And in fact, in Cape Town, that's the culture. Uh, so you eat at home or you eat out with your family. Yes. Yeah, if you want to have a drink with your mates, you go to visit each other. You don't go to pubs. That's you go true. To, you go see each other. Yeah. So when I came back, I continued that because it's entrenched in you. Mm. And so that's one. The second reason is you've been at the office from six to four. Where else do you want to go but home? You know, um, because that's, that's just... For me, th that's where I can go. M my home is a sanctuary. It's, it's a place where I feel completely at ease. I walk in shorts uh, and a t-shirt and I can blast the music the way I want. I can play with the dogs. I can, whatever it is that I do to relax. And so this routine of you know, exercising and then cooking and then reading and before you go to bed and then wake up reading and start that again, 
really works for me. People getting to top positions are not taking care of themselves. That's, that's a problem. And it's not because of people getting to top positions. Anybody who doesn't take care of themselves is a problem. Uh, True. Because uh, life is given to us to live and to enjoy. And this body needs to be taken care of in a certain way. I yeah. think you extend your life if you do that. And I only try. Uh, I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing. But um, you know, I'd like to be around for long. And yeah. so if exercise helps me to do that, so be it. Yeah. No, I wasn't, I wasn't digging a job. <laughs> but it's, just, it's just that the excuse, oh, I'm so busy. You know, this, the picture y'all paint for us is how busy it is. And, it is and busy. It is busy, that's but, the thing, but, but you, found a balance. you have to find a balance. You have to create time, and that's why, um, in my philosophy, it's you have to live that life by design, not by default. Because if you live it by default, you'll get into that narrative: I am busy, and then you're busy. Yeah, the universe gives you business to be busy with. If you say, I need an hour, I need four hours in my case to play golf in a week, you will find the four hours. It affects nothing. In your in your in your success rate, it affects nothing in what you do. Um, you have to find time to cook, find time to cook, find time to do something else. I find time to cook. Other people find time to do other things that relax them. But for me, that end of the day, getting into the kitchen for that one hour is really, really, really. It's ecstatic almost. It's 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 a beautiful thing. And then watching people eat off your hands, and then you know how do you end your day? Uh, probably listen to an audio book. Or if there is a, a sport, because uh, I follow sports, then I'll watch a game or something. And then go to bed. Okay. Mm. That's amazing. I mean, we need to have you back for a part two. Our time has run, uh, has run out. But do you, do you, I know you paid for it. I know there's no way you could have such wisdom and this, you're not pouring it into people. Of course, in your office, yes, but do you have? people you mentor? Yes, I do. Ah. Uh, and I do that very willingly and very easily because uh, uh, I am what I am today because I was also mentored. I was taught by people who knew better than me, who went ahead of me. The beauty of working in multinational organizations is, uh, depending on your attitude, uh, they are extremely good places for growth. My attitude when I got to 3M and my first job was in a multinational was not me seeing the opportunity. It had to be shown to me. And I had a colleague who said to me, you know, this is like continuing your education. Uh, the beauty about multinationals is like you're being in varsity or in college, but you're being paid. Mm. And that changed my thinking. So I didn't see it as work. I saw it as learning experiences. And so my time in all these organizations have been in, have been encumbered by opportunities of learning yeah I just get paid for it and so that attitude makes you gather so much and yeah. so because you've gathered so much you God forbid the bus knocks you down with this knowledge and you haven't imparted it on to anybody mm. else and so I deliberately impart that obviously the people you manage yes. benefit from it yes. but I also have coaching and mentoring programs that I run free of charge for those that I want to that feel that they can benefit from it. Right. And this range from top executives to starters. Right. So it just depends on who you come across and who's willing to listen. So people, if like I call you after this, say, okay, so Martin, um, are you willing? I'm, 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 I'm a willing student. Would you be an yeah, available teacher? Yeah, you're welcome. Teacher? Yeah, as long as you see something from me that you feel yes. you can learn. Yes. And that would benefit you in your career. Uh, yeah, and mm -hmm. I try and limit that, but it's also very difficult to just mentor you on your career because you're a holistic person. Yes. Uh, your life is your career on one sphere and then your, your personal space on the other side. And so how, how you mix those two is mm. really important. Yeah, okay. feel free. I'll charge you though. <laughs> <laughs> well noted, sir. Yeah. Well noted. Mm. Okay, but thank you for coming to the show. Thank you very much. This I really enjoyed this and thanks for, for hosting me. No, it was it was yeah. it was really good. Yeah, I've enjoyed you. it too. Thank you. And to you watching, thank you so much for watching. Um, the show will go up on YouTube right after this. If you need to watch it again, it will be repeating this coming Tuesday at 11 p.m. Until then, if you have any questions for Martin, let us know. We shall forward them to his office, or you want them to reach out to you directly. Uh, either way, I mean, uh, I would not, we are a public listed company, so we don't hide from people. Okay. So obviously, they can they can reach out to me, but also through you. Okay. How how can they reach out to you then? Uh, 
I wouldn't want to give my, my personal contacts here, but we do have an email that we monitor every day. Okay. Info at sassini.co.ke. Mm -hmm. Just uh, say attention, Martin, it will come to me. There you have it. So info at sassini.co.ke. And if that doesn't go through, then we promise to forward all your inquiries or anything you need to say to Martin. Thank you for watching tonight. Have a great week ahead.